the other uh, organizers for putting this on. This has been a spectacular uh, uh, kind of uh, island of uh, rational science during the, uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, and I'm always happy to, to attend whenever I can. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our, our project, a single molecule project, looking at a protein that acts like a paper ball. So the point of this talk is to draw an analogy between this protein sketched here and the paper ball that's kind of hovering behind it. Uh, this is work done by a spectacular grad student in the lab, Ian Morgan, uh, published in this paper shown here, and in close collaboration with Roy Beck's lab with his student uh, at the time, Ram Avinery, uh, funding sources shown uh, in the bottom left. So by way of uh, introduction to my lab, uh, our long running direction has been to use single molecule stretching, particularly at low forces, to study uh, polymer aspects of biomolecular behavior. So the classic sort of experiment is a magnetic tweezer experiment. Because magnetic tweezers are very stable, we can access very low forces, and in fact directly measure elastic responses due to these so-called blob models that you might be familiar with from, uh, from the work of Dejean and Pincus and others. Okay, so if we apply, look at this for, say, single-stranded DNA, we can see these interesting and strange nonlinear power law behaviors that have to do with the polymer acting like a self-avoiding uh, walk with a blob uh, elasticity. All right, and we've written some papers about this uh, and some review articles, as indicated there. Now, the motivation today, though, is to start taking this kind of insight and applying it to proteins. Now, of course, proteins come in a wide spectrum of order to disorder, and this image that I've, that I've taken from a simulation paper. Uh, on the left are, of course, the classic globular folded proteins, but on the right is what we want to focus on, are proteins that are either completely disordered or disordered with some light residual uh, structure. So these are proteins, particularly the very disordered ones, that would be well described by polymeric behavior. And indeed, many other authors have, have used such analyses. So uh, using scattering or FRET probes, people like uh, Foreman K and, and various papers from the, uh, the Schuler lab have looked at scaling laws of, uh, of intrinsically disordered proteins. Now, our focus today is in fact a little bit to the left of this to say disordered proteins, but that have some slight structure. And our basic idea is that the idea of this, this thrust in my lab is that single molecule stretching is extremely well suited to analyzing such proteins. And the reason is kind of twofold. Uh, single molecule stretching can reveal the polymeric behavior as we've shown in our prior work, but can also show through sort of mechanically forced unfolding reactions, a weak transient structure in the chain. And of course, a leader in this area is Michael Woodside who's published a variety of papers uh, on this kind of response of some disordered chains. So that's the, the thrust. Uh, today is our first uh, sort of a discussion of our first steps in this direction. Uh, and it will end up being a story about dynamics rather than equilibrium structure. So these polymer scaling exponents will not come back today. Instead, we're just gonna talk about dynamics of structure formation within a disordered chain. So the question we're gonna focus on in this short talk is, is as follows. If you take a disordered chain here sketched in kind of a random walks uh, way, and you suddenly change the force stretching it, so going from a high force to a low force, uh, F1 to F2, a so-called force quench experiment, how does the extension change in time? Equilibrium length changes, but what is the path of the red line? What is the length as a function of time? That's the goal today. Now there's two things that can affect that length trajectory. One is the dynamics of the entropic elastic response itself, which is to say relaxations of backbone bond rotations in the chain. Those dynamics are too fast uh, for us today and not, not the focus. Instead, we're gonna focus on this question of the formation of new structures. At high force, the force disallows structure formation. At low force, they can form. And this leads to some interesting slow dynamics. So by way of introduction on that, let's just review quickly the, the basic mechanochemistry of a cooperative folding domain. So this little sketch here indicates the cooperative folding transition of say a helix to coil uh, transition, but under force where the structured state is shorter than the unstructured state. Right, because it's cooperative, there's two local minima in the free energy diagram, but the transition times between these two states are of course force dependent as described by the classic kind of Bell-Zirkov mechanos chemistry where the, the transition state varies in a way linear with force times the distance to the transition state right, in the first order approximation. So that means as you go to the lower force, suddenly the folded state will be more stable and the system will jump over this barrier. 
So kind of in a, in a pretend data is shown on the right, here's the force profile. You get a force quench at time arbitrary units of one. After some waiting time corresponding to the, to the stochastic waiting time needed to cross this barrier, there's a cooperative folding transition of this little, this little unit. Of course, if you repeat this experiment many, many times, you get different stochastic times because of the random nature of the barrier crossing process. And if you were to average over many of these, you would find, in fact, an exponential relaxation from the initial to the final, uh, to the final state. And so this is a very common feature in many systems is that if there's a single kind of uh, process determining the relaxation, you would expect it to relax exponentially. So that said, now let's think a little bit about what, let's show you, I should say, what happens when we do a force jump experiment, a quench experiment on our intrinsically disordered chain. Uh, so the data is shown here. We in fact go from a force near 70 piconewtons down to about six piconewtons. We get a rapid entropic elastic response followed by a slow response. And unlike an exponential response, you will see that this slow response just keeps going and going and going over not just seconds or tens of seconds, but hundreds of second timescales. This is extremely repeatable if we go back down and up and down and up again. Every single time, the relaxation is long and spread out. If we focus on one of these relaxations and plot it instead as in the back on a linear time axis, but switch to a log time axis, we see that the extension versus time is changing in what looks like a linear manner on this logarithmic axis. So what that indicates, in fact, is that the length is decreasing logarithmically with time well described uh, by the equation shown here, where a, a key parameter for us today is the slope of the log relaxation b as sketched there. So this, in fact, is the first key observation uh, of the strange behavior of this system. Uh, it's indicating a so-called glassy response. This is a glassy response where there's not just one relaxation time, like in the helix coil system, but a spectrum of relaxation times. Why such a wide spectrum? Presumably because of some disorder in the chain. And this is thus a glassy response of the system. So what that disorder is, what even the chain is, I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, the second question I want to focus on for this talk uh, is a question of predicting the future. So now I want to go back and pretend we're thinking again about our helix coil system and say we do the force jump and we measure the trajectory both at short times and then at long times. And at long times, of course, it's equilibrated. And if I ask, can I predict the future extension of the equilibrated system? The answer is trivially yes. Once I measure it, I know it's going to stay close to that extension over, over a very long time. Technically, I can predict it if I, can, if I know the force and I know the internal parameter, which is the elastic response of the system. The non-equilibrium case is a little bit more subtle, of course, because just knowing the force and the spring constant or even knowing the time scale of relaxation alone is not enough. There's many different lengths that are possible. However, you could argue, well, if you know history, if you know when you jumped force, you could predict this curve. But I'm gonna say that there's a way to predict the future here without knowing the history for this system. And the way to predict the future is kind of to collapse the history by doing a measurement. So if at a single time you measure the extension of the system, say you get this blue dot, and you know something about the parameters of the system, then regardless of the history, you know that it is going to decay exponentially towards the equilibrium state. All right, so internal parameters plus one external parameter means that we don't need to know the history. This near equilibrium system has history free dynamics. So I'm saying that, of course, because it is in contrast, in fact, to what the protein that we're studying does. So we're going to do an experiment where we apply two forces prior to the final force. So it's a two-step protocol with a force F1, a force F2, and then a final force F3 that lies between the first two. And then ask, how does the extension change during the constant force application F3? And this is what it does the force, the, sorry, the extension initially increases, which is kind of what you would expect because the last force jump was up. So you'd expect it to get longer, but then quite surprisingly, it pauses, turns around and goes back down. All I stress at the same constant force, All right? So this is quite a counterintuitive and surprising phenomenon of this non-monotonic response in length, despite that the fact that the external thermodynamic parameter force is being held constant. So this is quite interesting. It's a well-known effect in the polymer literature, effectively the plastics literature. It's called a COVAX effect. Uh, COVAX measured this in plastics by doing temperature jump experiments and looking at volumetric changes in plastics. 
Uh, and what it indicates is that this system is extremely far from equilibrium. And you can sort of demonstrate that, and as nicely pointed out in this paper by Mosso and Schiartino, by the following uh, thought experiment. Say you do what I did before and measure extension at a certain time, and you measure an extension given by this gray dashed line. Because it's non-monotonic, there's two places on the curve that have that extension. In one case, it goes up, and the other case, it goes down. Therefore, no matter what instantaneous information you have, you cannot predict the future extension of the system. You need to know something about the past. In fact, the chain knows something about the past. When it's at this extension, it knows whether it was shorter or longer before, and therefore knows whether it will increase or decrease in extension. There are hidden internal parameters that we are not measuring from an, ex from an external measurement. That is memory. So this chain has memory, and the Kovacs effect is a demonstration of memory in this chain, history-dependent dynamics. So that is the, those are the two observations, the glassy logarithmic relaxation and the non-monotonic Kovacs effect that underline this entire talk. And all that remains for me to do is to, to try to explain to you why we think these things are happening. So I'll go through, through that uh, in, in steps, telling you what the protein construct is, what's going on with the paper ball analogy, and so on. So briefly, let's talk about the protein construct. The protein construct is, uh, is formed from the tail domain of so-called norofilament low molecular weight proteins. So norofilaments are a kind of intermediate filament that forms the cytoskeleton and axons, uh, particularly the blue things here where the red ones are microtubules. Uh, the meshwork of this norofilament, uh, the, the size of the meshwork of the norofilament network is set actually by these disordered spacers between rigid rod domains. And those disordered spacers are indeed our target. So a single protein contains a rod-like domain that self-assembles into the stiff filament, but then these brush-like projection domains. And the focus for us today is the tail domain of this NFL protein, and I'll call it NFLT. So we, in fact, cut it off and measure the 168 residue uh, chain, about a 64 nanometer contour length. In fact, we don't measure a single one because these lengths are a little short. We use the standard uh, polyprotein construct uh, used in single molecule manipulation, in this particular case by engineering thiols at either end of the chain and doing some disulfide reactions, getting up to repeat unit lengths of 10 to 30 and therefore contour lengths that are in the range that is very easily measurable with our magnetic tweezer. So that's the protein. Uh, let's now talk about the paper ball. So it turns out that a large number of groups have found that paper balls also display anomalous dynamics. I'm showing a picture here, particularly it's not a paper ball, it's a mylar ball uh, from the group of Shmuel Rubinstein. Uh, and many of you are familiar with this. If you crumple up a paper ball, you know that if you look at it over time, it slowly expands in size. And so this field is studying those kinds of slow expansions, particularly when you change the force applied. A key paper in this field was by Sid Nagel in 2002, where he showed that crumpled paper balls show logarithmic dynamics in response to step changes and compressive force. So this is a linear height log time plot, just like our linear length log time plots. And here you're seeing that mylar balls are quite spectacular, showing seven decades of logarithmic decay of height versus time, as compared to our experiments where we see about two or three decades. So the reason this happens uh, was explained in a theory paper by the authors shown here, Amir, Oreg, and Imri, and I'll call them AOI for the purposes of this talk. The AOI model explains the crumpled paper response as being a member of a class of systems, and there are other systems, electronic systems and so on, that show logarithmic relaxation due to the additive effect of independent exponential processes or modes. So without going through the math, let me just give you a, an idea of how this works. Let's say there was a system with just a single mode and I plotted its response on a length versus log time plot. A single exponential re relaxation on a log plot, on a semi-log plot will look like this with a certain time constant as shown here. Now, if we have an additive effect of multiple modes, then we would simply find the effect of a two mode system by adding the first mode relaxation plus the second mode relaxation. So this would be the kind of two step response if we had the time constants as shown here. But now the question is what happens if we add a third? And you'll kind of note that if we have one relaxation and a second one, we can sort of start to see a straight line on this plot, which would be the log relaxation. 
And we can keep that straight line going if we choose the right time scale for the third one. And the right time scale, it turns out, is if the first one is 100 times slower than the second, then making the third one 100 times faster than the second. So you have this kind of recursive relation where each successive mode is 100 times slower than the previous one. And this now gives you, it's a little wiggly, but it gives you a logarithmic-like response in the extension versus time. I'll mention that if we have multiplicatively spaced time scales, because of the Arrhenius relationship, that corresponds to uniform spacing, additive spacing in the activation barriers, meaning each factor of 100 in the main plot of times corresponds to an equal spacing of delta G between the first, second, and third modes. So all that remains now is kind of calculus is to get rid of the wiggles. What we need to do is add more modes and decrease the spacing. And indeed that does so. If we go to say 15 modes with a factor of two spacing, now you see over several decades, a very, very much a straight logarithmic uh, line on this plot. All right, so this is the AOI constraint. You can have logarithmic relaxation if you have uniform multiplicative spacing of times between the modes, which also corresponds to a uniform additive spacing of the barriers. Okay, so that's the AOI background. Let's talk a little bit about the COVAX. This is now a second, second paper by Lahini et al, including Rubinstein. Uh, and they showed basically that crumpled sheets exhibit a COVAX response. All right, so this is the data here. Here they're doing compression rather than tension. So in fact, what they do is start with a low compressive force, go to a high one and then an intermediate one. When they go to the last force, just like we did, they see a non-monotonic response. There's a fast elastic response followed by this non-monotonic COVAX response. And this is just to show that if I show our entire data trace, high force, low force, middle force, we see the same exact responses, a fast entropic elastic response in our case, followed by uh, a, a, a fast increase on the order of seconds and a long, slow decrease on the order of tens to hundreds of seconds. So how does Lahini explain this for the paper ball case? Well, what they do is say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the COVAX effect and the AOI mode structure. So what this plot is supposed to represent is the amplitude of, say, 10 modes, each one multiplicatively slower than the previous one. And we're going to track each mode individually in this thought experiment as we go through the force jumps shown on the left. So at the initial time, we've just switched to F2. The modes on the left are the fastest ones, so they initially were equilibrated at length one and they've started to decrease. The slow modes haven't moved at all. If I allow time to advance, then the fast exponential ones have equilibrated at the new red dashed line, which is the equilibrium length for F2, whereas the slow ones haven't moved at all because their time constants are so slow. And that's critical. Now at time 50, arbitrarily chosen, I switch to the third force. Now the equilibrium extension is this new red dashed line. You can see most of the modes are out of equilibrium, but what happens is that quite quickly, the fast modes go up to the new equilibrium extension. That gives rise to the initial increase in the COVAX bump, whereas the slow modes are still going down because they're sti they still have not relaxed from the initial very high force. Essentially, their time constant is much longer than this waiting time, so they don't even notice F2. So this is this highly non-equilibrium mode structure. This is effectively the source of memory in the system where some modes are going up to equilibrium, whereas the slow modes are still coming down from the initial force, all right? And so the glass physics is telling us these two things. There's a log relaxation due to this AOI constraint, number one. And number two, Lahini says that these are the systems. Systems with this AOI type mode structure will display the COVAX effect. So in that sense, we say that our disordered protein, because it displays COVAX, belongs to this crumpled paper glass uh, class of glassy systems. So what this means, particularly for our experiment, is we can rule out a sequential mechanism of crumpling, of, of, of extension decrease, a, a sequential mechanism where be there's some process A leading to an initial decrease, and then a process B that cannot occur until process A has occurred, and C that can't go until B occurs. This is not independent and therefore is not something that will give you a COVAX effect. What must be going on in our chain are several independent crumpling extension shortening events process A, B, and C, each independent of each other, but with widely separated time scales. So in a cartoon version, what we're saying then is that the logarithmic decrease from L1 to L2 in the initial 
part of the trajectory happens because there's certain subsegments of the chain that collapse quite quickly, whereas other subsegments haven't collapsed because they have much slower dynamics. They collapse on a longer time scale, giving rise to the later time decrease. The cartoon version of the Kovacs explanation is similar. It says when we go from F2 to F3, the fast guys, which had ex equilibrated at F2 and are short, act actually extend where certain other segments never even equilibrated from F2 are still in a long state from F1 and slowly collapse to give rise to the long mon non-monotonic tail of the Kovacs behavior. So we can push this further by doing mechanochemistry. I'm going to run through this in a little bit uh, quickly. But as we quench to different low forces, of course, if we go to a higher quench force, the relaxation is slower because the force slows down compaction. It's going in the opposite thermodynamic direction. And we can quantify this effect through some basic combination of this AOI constraint with classic Bell-Zirkov mechanochemistry. There's a variety of ways you can try to do this. The way that works is as sketched here. What we assume is that there's say four independent collapsing processes, but each successive one is equally spaced in transition distance from the previous one. So the first one has a transition distance delta x, the second one two delta x, the third one three delta x, and so on. Under an applied force, these all tilt linearly with respect to transition distance, giving rise to the AOI uniform additive spectrum of transition barriers. So if you take this expression that corresponds from that, that rationale and plug it through Arrhenius, plug it through the predictions, you can get a prediction of the log slope versus force. That's the orange line that exactly matches the data, um, uh, quite an extensive data set shown here. There's only one parameter in this fitting. That parameter essentially corresponds to the maximum number of independent collapses per segment. That number is about nine on max. We believe through trying to do multi-exponential fitting that the minimum is around three or four. So the number of collapses per tail domain is somewhere in this range based on this analysis. Okay, so let me finish to talk a little bit about the biochemistry. What do we think the microscopic origin of these effects is? Uh, a large clue uh, from the literature is to look at electrostatics. This is now a plot of the charge profile, average charge profile in a five residue window of the chain. It is largely a polyelectrolyte, but with some distinct regions of positive charge of uh, clusters of lysines. It is thought biologically that these lysine clusters are very important for determining interactions and, and say spacing in the neurofilament network. So because of that electrostatic focus in the literature, we formulated an electrostatic hypothesis Hypothesis where positive and negative things were complex, leading to a decrease in extension. And these could be the kinds of uh, modes in our system. However, at the, at the moment, we're not seeing any salt dynamics. You would expect salt screening to modulate that. We're not seeing it, indicating that electrostatics, I don't quite believe it's not present at all in this highly charged chain, but it's not dominant. What does seem to be dominant is hydrophobicity, right? So basically this is a relaxation in pure buffer. If we add denaturant, we remove the relaxation uh, almost entirely. Uh, and that corresponds likely to structure formation in these relatively neutral regimes of the chain. And this actually is now corroborated. I'm very happy that we've formed a collaboration with Joachim Zubiella and his postdoc uh, Upayan Ball, who've developed a, 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 sim a coarse grain simulation platform for disordered proteins. And they applied it to this chain and indeed found that you can see heterogeneous collapses between of subsegments in the NFLT chain uh, again, mostly uh, hydrophobic uh, mechanisms for those collapses. Okay, so the final thing, just one or two slides to say before I wrap up, is how is this related to other slow dynamic phenomena of proteins? Uh, of course, there's a famous and broad literature on glassy dynamics in globular proteins. This is just one example, but associated uh, with the work of Hans Fraunfelder, where they show that myoglobin has relaxation dynamics that are not single exponential, that are multi-exponential stretched types of responses. Uh, both globular proteins and our disordered chain uh, have to be showing these responses because there's some source of disorder that creates large activation barriers on various scales. That's just the basic phys physical fact. 
The mechanism in folded proteins is, this is a hard field to summarize in 30 seconds, but one of the mechanisms for some folded proteins uh, is that the disorder is basically what's called topological, which is to say the residues are kind of jam packed in here. And because of density and homogeneities, they relax on different time scales. And it's particularly hard to reconfigure both because of density and because the residues are connected, of course, by the backbone of the chain. The large barriers then correspond to these cooperative motions required to relax within this dense medium. What's interesting, I think, and of course, there's a lot of literature, Fraunfelder, these are theory reviews uh, by Wallenus and Theremoli uh, on this topic. Uh, the disorder in our chain is, of course, not at all coming from packing or density. It's a disordered chain. It's much closer to a random walk polymer. It is not dense. Instead, it's directly coming from the sequence, this hydrophobic patch there, that electrostatic complexation over here. All right. And the large barriers are, in this case, not coming from a cooperative mechanism from this, but is coming from a, a, a distributed mechanism where each segment is presumably uh, has a resistance to looping which comes apart partially or wholly from the application of stretching force. Okay, so that's the, this is the last slide now. The results, again, quite striking ability to see bulk glassy dynamics, both logarithmic relaxation and the counterintuitive COVAX effect in a single chain uh, that we explain with this crumpled paper mechanism that has some distinctions from the uh, glassy dynamics known in folded proteins. And of course, we've corroborated our picture quantitatively with this AOI Belzirkov model. Going forward, we're very interested to see what will happen with other disordered chains. We believe it's likely that some, but not all chains will describe this dynamics. Certain disordered chains are really quite disordered uh, in the sense of being nearly completely homogeneous polymers. And we wouldn't expect to see such dynamics there, but there is a class of chains that we believe will show this and we're actively pursuing that, that avenue. Uh, a sort of fundamental question we have that we don't have the answer of is that while this assumption works for our model to explain our mechanochemistry results, uh, that there's a uniform distribution of distances to the activation barrier, I do not know the fundamental reason that that would be true. And that's a puzzle that we're also hoping to work out. So with that, I'll again thank the organizer and thanks all of you for showing up. Thanks, Omar, for a really interesting talk. And there's uh, a lot of questions. We won't get to, we'll, we just do a couple um, real uh, quickly. So uh, I think you might've just answered it, but Philip Nelson way at the beginning asked if this COVAX effect is what we observe with silly putty. Um. Is it what we observe with silly putty? I, I, Phil, I'm very sorry. I don't know enough about the molecular mechanisms of silly putty. Certainly, I mean, the COVAX effect is, is seen in plastics. Whether you see a COVAX effect in silly putty, it's certainly a system that could show it, uh, but I'm not certain that it has been observed, okay? That's, that's the best I can say. Ralph Bunchu asked how uh, it depends on the length of the polymer and do yeah. the slower time scale collapses involve longer parts of the polymer? Uh, we don't know that part yet. That's something we're hoping to get out of the simulation, but we don't know. It seems likely because there would be longer distances to the transition state for a longer subsegment. Um, but that's within a tail. There, there's another part of that question, which is how does all these relaxation dynamics depend on the number of repeats in our polyprotein? And the answer is, is that I, if you looked closely at my theory plot, you'll notice I actually plotted not directly log slope, but renormalized log slope. So in that renormalized log slope, we do divide by the absolute contour length of the chain. And once it turns out the dynamics, of course, vary with contour length in an absolute sense, but once you normalize by contour length, they all collapse on each other. It's actually quite a strong point for our work uh, that, that that collapse happens. All right, so there's no relative dependence on the absolute contour length, the number of polyprotein repeats. Meredith asks if, uh, even though paper balls are you know, not, not what you study, uh, but if you know, if there's a simple way to understand the large range of time scales, and um, uh, there's another question about how uh, if if the large range of time scales um, might be related to fractal structures in a system. 
Yeah, I, I think the answer to that second thing is probably yes, okay, is that there is a, 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 a power law and therefore a long tail distribution of structures and crumpled paper balls. They are described by fractal distributions. Uh, I do not know the direct way to make the connection, but it does seem likely. The, the microscopic mechanism for the paper balls are typically discussed as, um, as little inversion events. There's kind of peaks that are under stress and that suddenly invert. And in fact, when you crumple a paper ball and let it go, you'll hear little popping events. And I know that Yoav Lahini, who is now a professor at Tel Aviv, is using actual microphones to listen to the distribution of times of the sounds of those popping events to understand the internal dynamics there. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's about as far as I can go with the paper balls uh, in, in terms of the microscopic mechanism. I'm not uh, obviously engaged in that research, so.